This is Lois Whaley for Women Today and Yesterday. Here we are, it's uh, already January 20th, and uh, you know in the early part of January, Channel 9 is busy doing things like inventory. So uh, it's a little later in the month than I often uh, do my taping. I'd like to mention a couple of things from Remember the Ladies, the book uh, which I uh, depend on by Kirsten Olson, which uh, has women. Uh, of course, it was made in the, it was actually copyrighted in the early 1990s, so it is not uh, particularly up to date with women today. I take a look here and I see 19th of January is actually the birthday of Janice Joplin born in 1943. Janis Joplin was uh, a famous uh, um, modern singer, okay, uh, rock and roll, I guess, uh, was her forte. She died um, quite young, actually, in 1970, uh, when she was uh, still in her 30s from um, drug overdose, they say, but she was sort of the, the first woman who really got into um, a lot of what we today call modern uh, popular music. And uh, I, they have a nice picture of her here in my book, which uh, shows her uh, actually in 1970, which was the year that she passed away. Now for the 20th of January, which as I mentioned is the day that I'm doing this uh, taping, we have uh, Joy Adamson, and she was born in uh, Czechoslovakia in 1910. And she's uh, most famous for her um, work in Africa with lions actually, so she didn't hang around in Czechoslovakia for too long, apparently. She um, wrote a very popular book called uh, Born Free, I believe it's called, or, um, yeah, Born Free, about a lion cub that she trained. And then uh, also there were other uh, books about uh, her work in Africa with uh, lions and uh, actually she died in Africa and it was thought for a time that one of the lions had attacked her but it, uh, they finally discovered that when uh, they had the autopsy that she had been killed um, actually by not by a lion but by some human beings who bashed her over the head until she died. And um, the men responsible for that act, I believe, were also later convicted of her murder. Joy Adamson, who wrote Born Free about the African lions and born uh, on January 20th in 1910. Well, now for January 22nd, we have a famous, very famous uh, 19th century woman. In fact, she gave her name to the era, and that was Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria actually died on January 22nd in 1901. And you know, she came to the throne in 1937 pardon me, in 1837, when she was just a teenager before her marriage and all that sort of thing. Um, so she was a very long-lived queen of England. I think she was probably the longest living queen of England until uh, our own current Elizabeth II, who has uh, been on the throne of England since, I believe, 1952 quite a long time, so she's had a, a golden jubilee already. Anyway, uh, Queen Victoria is often remembered, you know, uh, pictures of her show her quite an elderly lady. 
um, pretty fat, short, etc. And she said things leave it like, we are not amused. <laughs> Famously, when someone apparently tried to amuse her. Um, but um, she was once, of course, a, a little girl. And she didn't realize until she was being taught uh, English chronology at about age 10 that she was actually um, in line for the throne of England because uh, the current uh, George the, the Third's, a uh, couple of George the Third's sons were on the English throne and, and didn't have uh, someone to succeed them. So I think she was the uh, daughter of the third son of George the, the Third of England. So anyway, um, Elizabeth, pardon me, Victoria had a lot of children. She had nine children. Many of them went on to be uh, kings and queens and princes and so forth, princesses. In uh, Europe, during uh, her lifetime, she was the uh, grandmother both of um, uh, the George V who followed her and also of Wilhelm II, the um, Kaiser of Germany. And uh, she also had a very, um, something that she didn't realize in her own lifetime, that she was a carrier of the gene which causes in males um, blood not to clot uh, properly. So she was also a grandmother of um, the Tsar of Russia and his son, his only son, was afflicted with that problem because of the marriages all of all these families and genetics eventually caught up with, with uh, them and affected the Russian uh, Sarevich, I guess they call him. But of course, um, he was one of the family of the Russian czars uh, who was uh, murdered b during the Russian Revolution in 19. 17, I believe it was, perhaps 1918. That's probably a better year, more accurate year. Anyway, Victoria, being the mother of nine children, uh, had nine pregnancies, uh, at least, that we know of, and uh, all these children. And once when her, uh, one of her daughters said how wonderful it was to be a mother and the uh, the bearer of a baby that would uh, have a soul and would live to grow up and all this sort of thing and wasn't that wonderful and Victoria is supposed to have answered to her something along the line of oh yes but you know uh, actually you feel more like an just an animal like a cow or a dog or something when you have to go through uh, the whole process of birth <laughs> which can be um, quite lengthy and sometimes quite painful and uh, so on and that's what it takes to bring a child into the world well those are uh, three women who are associated about this time of January Janice uh, Joplin uh, the January 19th, Joy Adamson, January 20th, those are both birthdays, and January 22nd for Queen Victoria of uh, England. So, um, I notice in today's post that there is a beautiful picture which shows the Martin Luther King Jr. March that was held yesterday Martin Luther King uh, Day on campus. And one of the interesting things is that it shows the walk, part of a silent walk. Um, all the people that I can see right here are men. I think they're probably all members of Alpha Phi Alpha, which is the um, Negro fraternity on campus. And they're on their way from College Green 
in the silent march that was held yesterday to Baker Center, where there was a brunch and a speaker. And um, this beautiful picture shows them a, a couple of the men walking under the uh, motto that's on the old campus gate, so enter that daily thou mayest grow in knowledge, wisdom, and love, which is uh, above the old college gate, which is right at the corner of Court Street and Union Street. Very nice. Well, those are uh, several of the things that are uh, current occurrences. I also want to mention that the uh, dairy barn has a new showing of Athens, um, artists from Athens. They started out first with uh, Athens artists a couple of years ago, and then last year they uh, gave out a request to the other Athens cities in the United States if there were any artists who would like to submit um, some artistic work for the Dairy Barns Athens, USA, uh, they could. And I think last year there were only two other uh, Athens, um, USA people, probably from West Virginia and uh, Alabama, if I remember correctly. But this year they have um, submissions from at least five or six other Athenses, including one in New York State, which is just uh, 10 miles away from Catskill, New York, where my great-great-grandmother, Alana Du Bois Manning, uh, was born and grew up, and the Du Boises lived there for a long time, the family. But now they are all moved on, I think, to other parts of the U.S. So it's interesting that that uh, artist uh, from Athens, New York, has done something kind of like what the Dairy Barn is going to be doing later this year. Of course, you know this is the Quilt National year during the summer of which uh, we'll have Quilt National at the Dairy Barn. This particular artist from New York State works in fabric and so there are two not large quilt uh, type in terms of size but uh, two um, artistic renditions uh, in fabric and looking rather like uh, definitely there's quilting on, on them. Um, and that's uh, an interesting thing. But there are many other very interesting things in Athens, USA at the Dairy Barn, which just opened on Friday. And this morning I went to the gallery talk that they had, very interesting, about the uh, works of art there. I think there's something like almost uh, 70 works of art and um, represented uh, by about uh, 40 different artists from um, places within 30 miles of, uh, of an Athens. <laughs> and there are, gosh, I don't know, there are well over a dozen, I believe, Athens uh, towns named Athens in uh, the United States. Of course, they hark back to Athens, Greece, and uh, its uh, important role in the whole history of Western civilization, uh, Athens, uh, Greece. But um, I hope you'll uh, find a chance to go out and see uh, that uh, wonderful exhibit uh, with so many different kinds of uh, materials, paint, painting, things made of wallpaper, and things made of um, wood, and <laughs> just a great variety of things in the Athens, USA exhibit currently at the Dairy Barn in uh, Athens. So those are some of the things that uh, are current to our time. And now I want to talk about a couple of other upcoming things that uh, are, would be of interest to people. Next Monday, which I believe is the 26th of January, there is going to be 
a Kennedy lecture, you know, the, um, the Kennedys, uh, Edwin Kennedy and his wife, um, gave money, endowed money, to have uh, lectures by people with important things to say and, and often quite well-known people. And uh, one of the Kennedy lectures is scheduled for next Monday, January 26th at 7.30 at the Templeton Blackburn Memorial Auditorium. And the speaker is going to be probably the most famous uh, living historian who is a black woman. That uh, woman is Nell Irvin Painter, who um, is re retired now. She's emeritus, I believe, from Princeton University, uh, the author of at least seven books. And um, it's a little unclear what she's going to speak about because it's sort of interesting that in her, she's written, you know, at least four of uh, these seven scholarly books, works. But in addition, in uh, recent years, she's turned to a hobby of art. And so it's a little unclear whether she's going to talk about her artwork and maybe show some pictures of it, or if she's going to talk about some of the scholarly work that she has done uh, over the many years that uh, she was a professor at Princeton University. So anyway, I uh, brought um, this book which is called Sojourner Truth. This is one of her most famous works. She uh, looked at Sojourner Truth, a famous black woman um, who was an itinerant preacher in the 19th century. And um, probably the most famous um, speech that she ever made, as far as uh, is known to history, uh, was one that was written up, the description of it was written up by our own Southeast uh, Ohio woman, Frances Dana Gage. Because in 1851, when there was occurred in the spring of 1851, the um, second, actually, Ohio Women's Rights Convention and Frances Dana Gage was the uh, chairperson, chairwoman, at that talk in Akron in uh, spring of 19, 1851. Um, and Sojourner Truth, uh, according to the account made by Frances Dana Gage uh, some 12, some dozen years later, and also later still, reprinted in the history of women's suffrage because it was there in Akron at that women's rights meeting that Sojourner Truth made this uh, talk which is generally called Ain't I a Woman? Ain't I a Woman? I uh, could, um, you know, work. she was a, a, Sojourner Truth was a very uh, striking person uh, as a, an individual, she was almost six feet tall. She was one of the very, her ancestors must have been some of those very tall African people who came, uh, were forced to come to the, uh, what later became the United States during the times when they were still um, transporting slaves from Africa, which incidentally, um, ended in 1809, um, the bringing of any additional slaves from Africa was um, prohibited in the U.S. Constitution written in 1787. But um, of course by then there were a, a very large number of um, black slaves in the United States. and um, Sojourner Truth was not one of the southern slaves. She was a slave in New York State, which only abolished slavery in 1827, by which time Sojourner Truth was probably a woman of 
at least 30 years old. And she was born in the Hudson Valley um, near Kingston, New York, which is something that I've read a great deal about because um, nearby is New Paltz where uh, 12 Frenchmen who were Huguenots, uh, French Protestants, who uh, left Europe in starting in uh, 1660, uh, set up um, New Paltz. And um, so it was near Kingston, which is, oh, about 20 miles, I would say, from New Paltz, was where um, Sojourner Truth was born into a Dutch family. She was born as a slave and grew up and, and I guess maybe lived in another family uh, later on, perhaps was sold to someone else, but uh, someone who lived also in uh, the Hudson Valley, part of New York State, during those early days of slavery. Anyway, um, Sojourner Truth, who was named Isabella when she was young, Isabella Dumont, and actually the Dumonts are, are I believe, uh, of a French, French Huguenot family. Uh, well, anyway, um, she was a, a much, well, not older woman, but middle-aged woman, you might say, in her 40s, when she felt the call to preaching and named herself Sojourner Truth and became an itinerant going around to the northern states and speaking against slavery and for abolition of slavery. So in 1851, okay, by which time she was a woman in her 50s, she showed up at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron and, uh, in 1851 and made this speech, you know, ain't I a woman or whatever now. One of the very interesting things about Sojourner Truth's um, life and the Akron Convention is the take on it by uh, Nell uh, Irvin Painter, who is going to be speaking next Monday night at Memorial Auditorium at 7.30, is that um, uh, Dr. Painter doesn't think that um, she remembered correctly that um, uh, Frances Dana Gage remembered correctly. She kind of questions whether she ever said, whether uh, Sojourner Truther ever said, ain't I a woman? And, you know, showed her arm and all that kind of thing, which is uh, very striking and one of the reasons why she was remembered and resuscitated, so to speak, during the... Uh, wave of feminism that began in the 1970s, 1960s. Because a, a contemporary account was uh, given of that speech in Akron by a male reporter, uh, which doesn't include the words, ain't I a woman, at all. Now, some of the things that were, were said were uh, uh, the same. For instance, I, if I remember correctly, both the man who um, reported on the speech in 1851 and um, Francis Dana Gage, who wrote it up, uh, the memory that she had of that when she was the chairwoman of the meeting uh, in 1851, but wrote it up actually in 1860, during the Civil War in 1862 or 63. They both uh, mention the comment that she made uh, to one of the ministers who had said that um, women should not get the vote and they should not be involved in politics and they should not speak in church and so forth because uh, Christ didn't have any uh, women. Uh, you know, he had 12 male disciples and so on, but no women. Uh, sort of overlooking Martha and, and Mary, the um, sisters of Lazarus, who are mentioned in the New Testament. But anyway, um, Sojourner Truth's rebuttal to him was, 
that uh, Christ was from a woman and God, and man had nothing to do with that part of it. Those words were remembered by both the contemporary person who uh, wrote up uh, the 1851 speech and Francis Dana Gage, interestingly. So anyhow, I hope that a number of you will um, go and hear uh, Nell Irvin Painter next Monday night at Memorial Auditorium at 7.30 because she, as I mentioned earlier, is probably the most famous um, contemporary black woman historian. And I'm sure whatever she does, whether she shows her own art or whether she talks about some of the other things she wrote about in her time um, as an academic at Princeton University, um, I'm sure it will be very uh, interesting and entertaining. I have here, and I would, would show this book, I've shown um, Painter's book called Sojourner Truth. This book called The Feminist Papers from Adams to de Beauvoir is uh, and edited by Alice Rossi, which uh, came out in the uh, 60s, I believe, late 60s, has uh, this excerpt from uh, the history of women's suffrage and what Francis Dana Gage had to say about Sojourner Truth and um, the various things that she had to say at that time. But um, it's called the Akron Convention, pages 138, four, here I am without my glasses, 426 to 429 uh, about Sojourner Truth and the Akron Convention in the feminist papers. Now, um, other things that are coming up this year that I want to mention, you know this is uh, 2015, which means that you have uh, years ending in five which are coming up, um, anniversaries. For instance, in 1975, which is 40 years ago now, the first International Women's Day, um, I should say the first International Women's Convention by, held by the United Nations was held in 1975 in Mexico City, just uh, very close. It was in, in our uh, own part of the world. And then following that, of course, there <laughs> were some other uh, meetings. In 1977, I have on my coat permanently, as, if, as long as it will stay there, the 1977 convention, the Worlds of Ohio Women, held in 1977, on which I served as a member of the committee and even um, one of the chairs of the outreach committee. In uh, June, June 11th and 12th, uh, Worlds of Ohio Women at the uh, Ohio Fairgrounds in Columbus that year. And I've spoken about it before, and I'm sure I will uh, speak about it again, maybe when we get closer to June. But um, uh, in addition, the, uh, the international uh, Women's Year of 1975 opened actually what they called a decade of, um, for women, remembering women in uh, particular. So there was a meeting in uh, 1980 and uh, that one was held in Copenhagen and there was a meeting in Africa uh, that was held in 1985, and then the most recent meeting, really, big international, you know, women from all over the world attending, was in Beijing in 1995, and that was the last really, really big women's meeting. Since then, they've had Beijing plus 10, and 
now uh, we're having Beijing plus 20. So uh, these are special years for remembering women and what women are interested in, the many, many things they are interested in as individuals, as mothers, wives, sisters, uh, all the things that women do when they are adults. But um, in addition to um, the International Women's Years of things, we are also having the 100th anniversary of events in 1915. 1915 was uh, the first full year. Uh, actually, World War I uh, began in August of 1914, so it wouldn't have been a full year until um, in the summer of 1915. But um, um, it was entered into by, like I say, grandsons, grandsons of um, Queen Victoria were ruling in England, in Germany, in Russia, um, and they were fighting. When they got started in 1914, people thought, oh, the war will be over by Christmas. But of course it wasn't. It was a long and bloody war. And after the war, uh, there was a vindictive peace. There were uh, terrible battles, like the Battle of Verdun, uh, one of my strongest memories from 19, uh, 1956 when I was in uh, Germany with my husband who was in the army at the time and we would go out on weekends to um, visit and um, you know places associated in history over the years. Um, probably the most memorable place we went was Verdun where a million men died, they say, uh, in two battles because there were two very lengthy battles in Verdun uh, in different years of the war, which lasted from 1914 to 1918. But uh, um, World War I was a, a terrible time for sure. And uh, then later, within 20 years of the uh, signing of the peace of Versailles in 1919, uh, Europe was at war again. In the Second World War starting in September 1st, 1939 when I was a young girl of seven. And I can remember headlines from uh, World War II, of course. Well, um, I'm going to being remembering one of the women who was uh, an active academic, uh, Dean Virginia Gil Gildersleeve, and I'll talk more about her later. But she wrote this memoir after she retired from Barnard College in New York City, where she was dean, dean of Barnard College for many years from about uh, 1911 or so until the 1940s. She was the only woman a delegate from uh, that was on the U.S. delegation that wrote the United Nations Charter in 1945. And of course this year we will be uh, celebrating the 70th anniversary uh, year of um, the writing of the United Nations uh, charter and its acceptance it was accepted on October 24th, 1945. But in the previous spring, Virginia Gildersleeve had served on the delegation that wrote that charter and was one of the few women delegates actually uh, from uh, the various 48 countries that um, sent delegates to San Francisco in the spring of 1945 to uh, write the United Nations Charter. A very interesting woman indeed, and I'll be talking more about her later. Well, what else do we have here that's a contemporaneous uh, interest? 
One of the things um, is certainly Roe versus Wade, the abortion decision which was announced in 1973 on January 22nd, which means that two days from today when we are um, taping this show will be the 40, 40-something, 40 42nd, I guess, 42nd uh, anniversary of the Roe versus Wade um, decision by the Supreme Court, which uh, set up, uh, made abortion a legal, legally permitted under certain guidelines, often uh, considered the trimester system uh, of, of when abortion could be um, regulated by the states or by federal action. And so this book that I have here is called A Question of Choice. And it's by the lawyer who won the uh, Roe versus Wade decision in, uh, that was announced in 1973. Her name, Sarah Weddington, who was a young woman in her 19, in her, her 20s still. She was, I think, 25, 27 years old uh, when the Roe versus Wade um, case came to the United States uh, Supreme Court. Sarah Weddington and uh, this book, A Question of Choice, actually, um, I, I have a hobby of collecting books that uh, have inscriptions <laughs> by the authors, and this is one that um, I see the inscription from Sarah Weddington was in September of 1997. That was a time when she uh, was visiting in Athens uh, and spoke at a meeting that uh, was held by Planned Parenthood of Southeast Ohio at that time. Sarah Weddington, A Question of Choice. I haven't uh, read this a book or reread it, I should say, parts of it until just recently in thinking about the 42nd uh, anniversary coming up of the Roe versus Wade uh, Supreme Court case. And um, so, of course, you know, you forget who knows what, maybe 90% of what you read over the years. And I've found this very interesting to um, pick up again and reread parts of it. I knew, um, I remembered that Sarah Weddington herself had had an uh, abortion, an illegal abortion, because it was illegal in the United States, in uh, I think every state in the U.S., except for two or three, perhaps, in the 1970s, uh, New York State being one of the ones that had legalized abortion, I think, from about 1967. Now, I remember those days pretty well because, of course, I was a relatively younger woman 40 years ago. I was only in my 40s myself in, in the 1970s. And in, in the uh, 1960s, I was even younger. Uh, so I remember the question question that came up about 1963 or so, 64, of a woman in Arizona who wanted to have an abortion. Um, she wanted to have one in the U.S. somewhere legally, but uh, really couldn't in those days uh, because she had taken thalidomide during her pregnancy. And it had been discovered while women were taking thalidomide, which was a drug which made morning sickness uh, less terrible. Morning sickness, many women are uh, plagued by morning sickness in the early months of pregnancy, which means they had, you know, they felt very nauseous and, and would throw up and stuff like that early on. I, I was one of those lucky ones who never had morning sickness during my uh, three pregnancies, 
but um, many women did, and this woman in Arizona had taken thalidomide, and it was discovered that babies were being born without arms. Some of them had fingers attached to their shoulders. Some of them had toes attached where their legs should be. And um, so there was a move to um, get rid of the use of thalidomide, obviously, which was, was causing this, um, not to everybody apparently, but to some women who took thalidomide uh, to oppose morning sickness. But she uh, couldn't get a legal abortion in the United States, and she finally uh, flew to Denmark, I think it was, where abortion was legal and had the uh, procedure, and it did turn out that she had a fetus that would have been, had this uh, uh, terrible uh, um, problem of, um, you know, fingers on the shoulders and so on. But she faced a great deal of opposition uh, in Arizona where the folks lived. I think they actually had to move away from Scottsdale or something where they were living because of um, exasperated people who oppose abortion so much that they would, you know, uh, leave nasty messages and all that kind of thing um, on this woman's place, her home where she had was living with her husband and three or four children that she had. Um, anyway, I remember hearing about that in, in those days in the 1960s when that happened. Now, um, Sarah Weddington, as I mentioned earlier, had had an illegal abortion in the late 60s. She, she and her partner, her male partner, who they, when they were later married, they were both law students uh, when they first got together. Um, she uh, and her partner had gone to Mexico uh, for that illegal abortion. But then there was all this fuss, especially after this problem earlier in the 60s with the, with the woman from Arizona that I mentioned earlier. And um, in Texas, there were uh, pretty stringent abortion laws. Of course, there are still very stringent abortion laws in, in uh, Texas, although uh, immediately after Roe versus Wade, they, they had to um, permit uh, um, abortions under certain conditions. But nowadays, Texas is one of these uh, places where they are trying to uh, pass laws. I think they have passed laws saying that uh, abortion clinics must have um, hallways which are wide enough for a moving uh, bed, you know, um, in case there should be uh, some sort of a problem, of which there are much fewer uh, in Sarah Weddington's time. Uh, the the um, incidence was something like, um, women who were having problems after abortions were only one-eighth as many as the women who were having problems after childbirth because childbirth is actually uh, more dangerous, uh, statistically at least, uh, than uh, abortion, especially abortion during the early months of pregnancy, the first trimester, the first three months, or the uh, second trimester the, uh, during the first six months of pregnancy. Anyway, um, in a, a question of choice, Sarah Weddington describes the preparation that uh, she underwent as a lawyer. She was um, a member of the Texas Bar by 1970, uh, 71. She was a member of the Texas Bar and one of the few uh, women lawyers who was really interested in this whole problem of abortion. She and some other friends from uh, Austin, Texas, where she was living at the time, looked for a case that they might uh, bring um, in the courts to oppose the uh, 
prohibition of abortion in the state of Texas. And in 1971, they found uh, a woman who wanted to have an abortion but couldn't because of the fact, she was pregnant, obviously, but couldn't because of the Texas laws. And uh, they um, enlisted her aid, and she became Jane Rowe, that is to say, uh, an anonymous person. Her real name was not given, uh, whose name uh, is on Roe versus Wade, the, um, the, the Supreme Court case. Well, interestingly, the actual presentation before the Supreme Court was in 1971. In December of 1971, and it was um, a little bit over two years, um, well, let's see, I guess that's a, that's a little wrong because it was uh, Roe versus Wade was actually um, passed by the United States Supreme Court in January, in January, January 22nd of 1973. So that was a little over a year, I would say, from the time that Sarah Weddington uh, went to New York, uh, pardon me, well, she went to New York, but that was to consult with a man who was uh, writing a uh, scholarly article on uh, um, abortion laws of the different states in the United States. She went, of course, to Washington, D.C., to the U.S. Supreme Court um, in December, December 13th, I think, 1971, and uh, she, she described the scene very interestingly. You know, um, the Supreme Court chamber is something like 80 feet high. I did, it's sort of hard to imagine. But I guess maybe that is the case because you've seen pictures of our beautiful U.S. Supreme Court with 16 columns out front. It's right across from the, from the U.S. Capitol and uh, right next door to the Library of Congress. So it's a, it's a beautiful place that was actually built during the um, Franklin D. Roosevelt administration. But she had prepared very thoroughly for uh, her speech um, because they are only given half an hour to make a presentation. They have uh, people who are on one side for half an hour and people who are on the other side for the other half hour. Uh, Wade was a government official in uh, the state of Texas and that's why his name appears on the case. Roe, Jane Roe versus Wade, um, this um, uh, I think assistant attorney general of Texas at the time. But um, they had a stack of amicus curiae, which are the people who support a um, who support a case before a court of people. Uh, well, there were a, a stack a foot high, she said, of amicus curiae from various women's groups and so on, several religious groups. Um, various ones that had become uh, so uh, worried about the fact that a number of women were dying from illegal abortions, uh, from bad, um, you know, illegal people who weren't really doctors, and some were self-induced. Um, terrible idea of trying to induce abortion. Abortion was not illegal in the United States, not very prevalent, but it was not illegal in the United States until the into the 1870s. In the earlier years, it had not been an illegal act, shall we say. But um, once the doctors got in uh, many more doctors, there, there began to be passed laws against abortion. And um, but it was uh, interesting that um, 
Sarah Weddington was so well prepared for her half minute, her half hour before the Supreme Court. She didn't get to actually do much presentation per se because there were many questions from seven, the seven sitting justices at the time. Um, two of the Supreme Court justices had um, retired and so there were only seven who heard the original presentation December uh, 1971. However, by the time that um, there were two new members of the Supreme Court, uh, by the time the uh, ruling came down in 1973, January. So, um, the uh, sitting justices, and of course none of them was a, a woman in those days. The first woman uh, justice was Sandra Day O'Connor, who, uh, uh, who was named uh, in uh, the 1980s by President Reagan. They were all men, of course, uh, earlier than that. And um, uh, they were uh, the ones who were asking questions about various uh, matters that they, and she was able to answer most of them, I guess, uh, properly. One of the things she did was to cite an, the amendments to the U.S. Constitution, which um, showed that abortion was not considered a crime. One of the things she cited was the 14th Amendment, which talks about uh, citizens who are born or naturalized, doesn't say anything about fetuses. And um, she cited several other uh, amendments and apparently that was one of the persuasive arguments that uh, um, mattered in the long run. But anyway, um, like I say, January 22nd, uh, 1973, 42nd anniversary of Roe versus Wade, which sets up uh, thanks to um, Justice Blackman, who I think was one of the new appointees, actually, uh, to the Supreme Court, who didn't hear the original arguments, but uh, did uh, weigh in in uh, 1973, but did not hear the, the original arguments in 1971. But he was the one who, um, proposed the idea of the trimesters, no, um, uh, no opposition to abortion during the first trimester, decision between the woman and the doctor. In the second trimester, the uh, states could um, uh, regulate abortion in the interests of the health of the woman. And in the third trimester, in consideration of the health of the unborn fetus who was not yet a born citizen of the United States, which is one reason why opponents of abortion so often speak about pre-birth, pre-born child and, and so forth. Unborn child, unborn child um, is a term that they frequently use. But um, Sarah Weddington pointed out that that was not really uh, in the historic uh, understanding of uh, who was a human being, that birth was uh, a part of the consideration in the Constitution, in early amendments to the Constitution in 1791 and in uh, 1867 or 68 when the 14th Amendment was uh, adopted to the Constitution. Well, anyway, there is an important uh, anniversary coming up, Thursday, uh, January 22nd, in this year, 2015. And uh, I hope that uh, all of you will be looking forward to upcoming things, visiting the Dairy Barn, for instance, and seeing Athens artists from within 30 miles of seven cities named Athens in the U.S. of going to here next Monday on um, January 26th at 7.30 at Templeton Blackburn Auditorium uh, 
the uh, talk by Nell Irvin Painter, and uh, it's good to be back with you. Uh, I'm just getting a message that it's about time to wind up and wrap up uh, today's uh, session, which as you know, Women Today and Yesterday, we've covered quite a few uh, from uh, Queen Victoria, mother of nine children, um, to Joy Adamson, uh, the uh, woman who celebrated the Lions of Africa, and Janis Joplin, uh, the famous uh, singer who died of a drug overdose in 1970. So we have a variety of women there that we're, we're thinking about, as well as Sarah Weddington of the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court case in uh, 1973 finally announced, and the fact that uh, we'll be talking more uh, upcoming about Dean Virginia Gildersleeve, uh, who wrote the book Many a Good Crusade and who backed uh, women's rights and uh, of women students at Barnard College and women faculty at Barnard College uh, and served on the U.S. delegation that wrote the United Nations Charter uh, beginning in April of uh, 1945, ending in June of 1945, and finally adopted by the nations of 48 nations of the world in October of 1945. So welcome to the Fives. This is Lois Whaley for Women Today and Yesterday.